together. So it's, it's really a great honor to be here and to uh, benefit from uh, the work that you've done and the vision that you have about how we make this world a place of justice and peace and dignity for all of us. So just a big thank you uh, for all of that. And specifically, you know, I, I wanted to say a few words about the recount that uh, we have just completed now in three states, in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. I want to say a few words about that recount and what the recount says about our election system in general and what the crisis in our elections says more generally about the crisis in our democracy which is very much the fight that is at our doorstep right now today and gets back to the kinds of practical actions that we've been discussing today. So I'll just say you know, a few remarks and then we can open it up to discussion, comments, questions, and so on. So first, um, on the recount, um, on the recount, um, we, identified three states, uh, Michigan, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, that all had particular red flags. So, so I was approached by an election integrity coalition um, uh, about a week before Thanksgiving. And they were looking into whether or not we really had a legal case. And I only heard from them uh, with a thumbs up on Monday before Thanksgiving. And the first deadline was Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. So by the time we did the FEC compliance and all that to make sure that we had a dedicated fund so that there would be no question we were fundraising for the recount and only for the recount. This is not for my vacation home somewhere in, um, you know, in the Caribbean or something like that. Um, this was a recount fund. By the time we had our paperwork in order, it was Wednesday afternoon before Thanksgiving weekend. So we were not terribly optimistic that we were gonna be able to raise $2.4 million which in, in two days, which was the fee that we had to pay in uh, Wisconsin on Friday. But the long and the short is all we did was put out a press release that we were going to seek confirmation that this was a vote we could trust in three critical states. We just put out a press release and we put up a web page to receive the funding. And it took on a life of its own because I think uh, dis distrust, untrust, cynicism about the election runs very high. As Donald Trump himself said, he thought it was a rigged election. As Bernie Sanders said, it's a rigged economy. We're sort of living in the age of the rigged and who's paying the price, you know, it's the 99%. It's the everyday people who are being thrown under the bus. So why in the world would people have paid attention to this when we had an opportunity to withdraw into our own little private spheres, to meet with our families over Thanksgiving? No, we the American people stood up and within about six hours we had blown through the first, uh, the first fee, which was 2.4 million. And within about uh, 24 hours or so, we had raised enough that we could begin to move ahead in all three states. It was absolutely incredible. And it seemed to me like we, the American people, were saying, we want something to be thankful for on Thanksgiving, so we are going to be what we are thankful for. We standing up for the democracy we deserve. And I have to say, since then, just being out there in the world um, and being at the airport in Atlanta. So many people are tuned into this and I usually say, what does it mean to you? And for some people, it's, it's the integrity of the vote. For other people, it's just fighting back that we need a way for us everyday people who are being kind of locked out here of a future. And people are feeling this on so many fronts, not only immigrant rights, a generation locked into debt, of uh, college debt, uh, for those who don't qualify for free, free tuition, and there aren't very many who do, um, you know, uh, that this is a generation in crisis. These are workers in crisis uh, who don't have the jobs that we need. Uh, we also deserve to vote without fear. 
without fear that your vote is mistakenly going to help someone that you may be very much opposed to. So it turns out there is a voting system that would enable you to vote for the greater good, not for the lesser evil, which is kind of the deal that so many people feel like they're forced to make. You feel like if you vote for the candidate you believe in, uh, your candidate may not win, and then you may inadvertently help the greater evil win. Uh, so this voting system was actually just adopted by the state of Maine. It already exists in many cities around the country and in countries around the world. It's called ranked choice voting. It lets you rank your choices, so you don't have to go into the voting booth and kind of make a gamble uh, based on you know, trade-offs. Instead, you can actually bring your values into the voting booth. So you would put your first choice first, maybe it's an underdog, but it's a candidate that has, that actually stands up for immigrant rights as human rights, for a welcoming path to citizenship, for uh, health care, for college, as human rights extended to all residents of the country. Um, you could vote number one for the candidate you believe in, knowing that if that candidate loses, your vote is automatically reassigned to your number two choice. And then you can even list a third choice if you want it. So it ensures that your vote will support the candidate that you most support uh, and that you are not going to be splitting the vote, you're not going to divide the vote, you're not going to be spoiling the election in any way. And uh, just for the record, I want to go on record here, that if you look at green votes in this election, most green voters would not have come out to vote if they couldn't have voted green. We know this from a variety of polls, also from exit polls. So it's just not true that green votes would have translated to uh, Democratic Party votes. In fact, of those people, 61% of Greens would have stayed home. Of those who would have come out, over one-third would have voted for Donald Trump, perhaps as a protest vote against the Democrats or what. I don't know. But it's just not true. Simple rules do not apply. Voters are complex. We're weighing a number of issues here. Um, and so Greens would have not sort of combined with Democratic votes. The number of Green votes that would have contributed to Hillary Clinton would not have made a difference in any state. So any blaming or finger pointing going on here is entirely misguided in terms of the numbers. But in terms of the broader concept, it is very misguided to think that we should just have two official state political parties and be like what, Russia or Iran? Democracy requires many voices and many choices. Democracy requires vigorous opposition. That's where real debate happens. So rather than suppressing opposition voices, which is very dangerous for democracy, we need to be fighting together for ranked choice voting to ensure that we can actually stand up for what it is that we want, for health care for everyone as a human right, for a right to free public higher education, which, by the way, pays for itself many times over. There is no doubt about that. It should be funded completely right now. And we bailed out the friggin' uh, crooks on Wall Street who crashed the economy. It's time to bail out a generation of young people holding student loan debt that just cannot be paid back. If we could come up with the trillions to bail out Wall Street, we can come up with 1.3 trillion to bail out young people. So, um, and last final, two, two last final reforms. End the Electoral College, a holdover from the days of slavery. We need to have a direct popular vote. We would have a different outcome in this election right now, if that was the case. Uh, and finally, we need to get the big money out of politics. This has been going on for a long time way too long. Instead, we need to have public financing. In my home state in Massachusetts, we actually passed rank, um, a public financing for elections. We passed it as a voter referendum, and I'm sorry to report that our legislature then repealed this voter referendum, which had passed by a two-to-one margin, and it was repealed by a Democratic legislature, which to me said, that uh, perhaps the real change we need is not going to happen under the political establishment as we know it, under either wings of it. Um, and that is what made me a confirmed green. 
uh, when I saw this happen mm, 15, 16 years ago. Um, so at any rate, getting big money out of politics is really critical if we are going to get the people back in. We can do this. Uh, the people want to do this. It should be part of our broader agenda. And just as a footnote, by reclaiming the public airwaves, which belong to us, we the people, which have been given away essentially free to very large corporations who are not fulfilling their public responsibility to educate the public on critical matters of our future, like our elections, uh, we can make public financing affordable by requiring free airtime from the public airwaves and those who are in possession of those public airwaves. Big corporations, the big media needs to provide free public airtime for qualified candidates, whether it's at the national level or at the local level. We need to uh, have a public which is fully informed and empowered. This is one of the uh, cornerstones of democracy. So that in turn enables us because the price tag will come down so dramatically once you have free communications and uh, free public education, free debates, free and open debates, the price tag for political campaigns comes way down uh, and makes it possible then for us as taxpayers to actually have publicly funded elections so that they are not effectively privatized and sold out to the highest bidder. Uh, the greatest democracy that money can buy is not a democracy at all. It needs to be a democracy of, by, and for we the people. So with that, let me uh, just announce two dates for you to keep in mind. Um, we will be part of a, a broad coalition uh, for Occupy the Inauguration on the 20th, uh, because in my view, democracy is not being served. Uh, by the current administration, and we could have a longer discussion about that if you're interested, but I think there are very principled reasons for us to register uh, our, our uh, distrust and our distress at the way that this administration is rolling forward. Um, and uh, that will be on the 20th of January in Washington, D.C., and I presume that um, uh, events and protests are also being organized at the local level. Uh, and we are hoping, and we'll announce soon, to hold a conference the following day about how we continue to build this broad movement that we really need right now. We need to dig in on the practical things that we can do right now in our communities, and we've heard many of them discussed here today. But we also cannot afford to be divided. If we are divided, we are conquered. And the more we can join together in a broad coalition for people, planet, and peace over profit, the more unstoppable we are. In the words of Alice Walker, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. We have the power. This is kind of the Hail Mary moment, whether you are looking at um, immigrant rights, a generation locked in debt, a climate which is in terminal meltdown right now that needs to be stopped by really uh, substantive action by our economy which continues to unravel. Uh, we are in a situation right now that uh, really calls on all of us to stand up for our deeply held beliefs in democracy, human rights, justice, and sustainability. The minute we stand together, we are absolutely unstoppable. And the minute we stand up with the courage demonstrated by the likes of the Dreamers, by the likes of uh, the uh, Standing Rock Sioux, and uh, indigenous people, and, uh, black and black and brown people all over the country and all over the world, for whom these battles are not new, for whom this is a very old battle, uh, this is the time for us to follow your lead and take courage from uh, the courage that you have shown for decades and for centuries. Uh, you have been kind of the canary in the mine shaft. We are all now in that mine shaft. It's time for us to stand up and work together. One last date I want to mention, and this is February 25th. This is tentative to be confirmed, but we are looking to hold a voting justice conference. Uh, this one probably in Philadelphia a voting justice conference 
uh, to help build a coalition to work on all of those issues that I mentioned are absolutely critical. Uh, we need to fight on each of those issues alone, but we also need to be a broad coalition working together so that we can, in fact, seize the power that we have in, the, in this uh, absolutely critical moment for us to stand tall and stand together. So again, thank you all so much for the leadership that you have shown and are continuing to show. I really look forward to continuing to work with you uh, over the coming months and years. Thank you so much. Over here? Yes, I was wondering how much it's been discussed. Is it feasible that Jill Stein uh, could run at the midterm elections in Senator from Massachusetts? Um, that's an interesting question, um, which has not, you know. We have not yet even debriefed from the, uh, because we rolled right over, we thought we were going to do a debrief and start to put together our strategy, but, and then we, we took up the call for the recount, and which really only stopped the day before I came out here. So we'll see, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm in this as a mother and, and as a medical doctor. For too long, I studied what was going on, and what I studied was this, you know, epidemic of asthma and diabetes and all this stuff that is uh, very much downstream of the uh, exploitation of people and our our natural environment and our water and our food and all that. It's all been kind of co-opted to make a big profit for very few people, and it's making us all sick. Whether it's our food system, our transportation system, our energy system. Uh, poverty in and of itself, you know, we are very sick as a society right now and I felt like for too long I was documenting that and studying that and it just became intolerable and so, you know, I'm in a position as a mother that I realize all of our kids now are on the same boat and none of them are going to make it uh, at the rate that we're going. So I feel like uh, I, I, I joined the ranks of the Mothers on Fire and the Fathers on Fire and the Sisters and Brothers on Fire, that we are here to do everything that we can uh, until our last breath and then even after that, you know. Th there will be no stopping us because, uh, you know, we are here uh, to create an America and a world that works for all of us. Either it works for all of us or it works for none of us. What is the status of the recount? Okay, great. So effectively, the recount was shut down at every turn. Um, uh, it, it, uh, it went forward for three days in uh, Michigan before the courts, the state court, shut it down. Why did they shut it down? They shut it down saying that I did not have standing, basically because I wasn't the runner-up. Had Hillary Clinton stepped forward? Had the Democratic Party stepped forward? There could have been a recount. But they did not, and they usually don't. Um, they seem, you know, to be concerned about a smooth transition of power. And that is a concern, but I think many of us would say it's not the smooth transition of power, it's the legitimate transition of power that counts. It, was, it never got started in Pennsylvania for the same reasons. It went forward in, in Wisconsin, but not where it most counted, in the black and brown communities around um, Milwaukee. So it was effectively stopped. It was a broken recount that reflects a broken election system. And, you know, it was a success because it answered our question Is this a voting system we can trust? And it gave us a resounding no. It's up to us to create a voting system we can trust. Who else was involved? I know that the uh, Clinton campaign stepped in to keep an eye on the count, the recount. I also believe that Trump's campaign tried to block it. Were they involved in blocking it? Can you share that with us? Uh, they did. Um, Trump's campaign, his super PACs, and the Republican Party all filed lawsuits in various states to slow the recount down, to push it right up against the deadline for the Electoral College, 
uh, and to make it very expensive, and to basically prevent voters from having a right to a verified vote, which is why this should be built into the process. Let me mention quickly, growing out of the recount in 2004, some very important things happened. Those recounts were also um, effectively shut down, but they did expose real critical problems, including with the voting technology. So it was out of that that a reform movement for uh, voting integrity was born. And the state of New Mexico, because of the lawsuits that were filed, they actually got a legal mandate to the legislature to fix the broken system. And out of that, they passed exactly the laws that are needed. They got rid of the electronic machines, they uh, instituted automatic audits of paper ballots, and they created automatic recounts uh, when the election was very close. So it is an example of a success story and how we can reduplicate that. So that is one of the things that we are working on with groups in each of those states and with uh, election uh, voting justice advocates around the country to ensure that we come out of this uh, taking some real critical steps forward and that we work with uh, our state legislatures in order to do that. Um, Judy and then, go ahead. Dr. Stein, uh, first of all, welcome to Texas and to San Antonio and actually to South Texas. Uh, my husband and I are coming in from Eagle Pass, Maverick County, which uh, actually we still use paper ballots because we're in rural America. <laughs> Having said that, um, and also for you to come to South Texas uh, under, with the, under the auspices of Southwest Voter, which is a long-standing organization that many of us have been involved in, frankly, for, for numerous years, and working to get more Latinos, Mexican-Americans originally, and now the broader uh, scope of more Latinos engaged in politics. Um, what I'm curious about, and, and I will also state to you, I am a lifetime Democrat, been uh, in, in, in very involved in the Democratic Party. But having said that, have always been um, watched what the Green Party has done to bring out the important issues regarding environment. And so, one more point, which is, we are the state that is one of the largest non-voting Latino states. I think we are the, the largest non-voting Latino population states, meaning we have registered, but not, uh, and That's so. That's actually not true, I'll tell you later. Okay, well, but, but larger, larger. Having said all that, how can we frankly work together? I'm, I, I'm a proponent of uh, environmental support, uh, all of those types of issues. And so I'm, I come more from that stance, admittedly, but appreciate what you've been doing and also thank you for uh, working on the recount issue just for frankly exposure to the larger issues. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I think there are lots of ways for us to, to work together. and. Um, you know, the, the, the Bernie Kratz, I think, are kind of a good example of many people who are very sympathetic to a green agenda. Um, many, some of the Bernie Kratz have come over, some are still, you know, in uh, kind of in their own political island right now. Some are back inside the Democratic Party. I think we are in a state of political realignment right now. And the more we are talking to each other, uh, the better. The more we're talking to each other on a principled basis, the better. Um, I share a lot of sympathies with uh, Jonathan Ryan, who spoke before from uh, Raices, that we are in a crisis moment right now, and that crisis, um, you know, was uh, was enabled by both political parties that have both been captured by big money, uh, and that we need to fight that capture. And for those who want to stay inside the party and keep fighting it. Good luck, you know, more power to you. Um, uh, different people have uh, reached their limit at different points, but I think it's really important. The most that we can do to enable you to fight for change inside the Democratic Party is establish an alternative to the Democratic Party to really force it to, you know, fish or cut bait. So I think there are lots of ways we can collaborate and that passing ranked choice voting enables us to do this in a way that uh, you know, takes the, the real fear out of this process and really opens up the dialogue so that as parties we can 
um, compete with each other in a way that a healthy democracy relies on. Fear should not be what drives our votes. It should be our values that drive our votes. And for us to collaborate on ranked choice voting, I think, would be absolutely phenomenal and you know, would really advance all the issues that we share inside of uh, all the parties. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Vanessa Sanchez and fellow native San Antonian, and I'm a part of several grassroots organizations here, one Polish Queers and the other one the San Antonio Progressive Alliance. And I've had my limit with the Democrats, so uh, thank you for being there during the Dem exit, because we really needed you and we still need you. Um, but I wanted to ask about your fight for uh, decriminalizing marijuana and uh, you can just touch on that and how we can uh, continue to fight on a local basis, on a state basis, um, before it gets over to the national. Great. On, on that issue in particular, please? Yeah. Okay, great. Yes, okay, so just in, uh, in uh, deference to my, my, uh, my flight, at 1:30, uh, uh, this will this will be the last question. But I hope this will be you know the opening of a dialogue, and that our organizations will be very uh, closely working together, um, because I really do believe that the struggle of of the Latino community, the the Mexican American community, you know, it really is kind of the epic battle that is being fought now by everyone. That this battle has generalized the battle for human rights, the battle for immigrants. We are in the age of, of um, refugees right now, 60 million and rising from war, poverty, and climate change. And those things are not getting better. In fact, they are getting worse. So it's really important that we come together and we not only fight for immigrant rights and human rights uh, and for an end to this refugee crisis and an end to the things that are causing the crisis, we need that big coalition in order to, to fight this battle for really what kind of world uh, we're going to have. On the issue of uh, drugs, um, you know, it's, it's very clear, and I can say this as a medical doctor, that, that uh, marijuana is a substance which is dangerous because it's illegal. It's not illegal because of some inherent dangerousness. In fact, marijuana is far less dangerous than alcohol and tobacco, which are completely legal. So, um, you know, the numbers of states now that are allowing either legal marijuana or, um, or recreational, legal uh, medical marijuana or recreational marijuana it is growing by leaps and bounds. My own home state in Massachusetts just passed uh, legal recreational marijuana. It's now legal to grow your own marijuana. And I speak, I'm not a user, I've never been a user, I'm just one of those boring teetotaler type people. But um, I think it's very important that marijuana not be used as an excuse to throw black and brown people in jail, which is mainly what the war on drugs is about. I think it's very important that our uh, drug enforcement agency use science. And the minute it uses science, then marijuana and hemp come off the list of of restricted and scheduled drugs, um, and that uh, you know that that the people who've been wrongly incarcerated for nonviolent uh, use of a substance that they in fact be restored to their full uh, freedom and citizenship, and that the um, uh, the criminal record be stricken from the record. Uh, I think this has been a very unnecessary and tragic. A component of, of our history and one that we need to put behind us as quickly as possible. The experience of the states that have legalized, you know, have shown that that the fear-mongering about this just doesn't take place. Uh, there is not an epidemic of child use or, or automobile crashes and things like that. Um, this is actually a far less dangerous substance than, um, than alcohol and tobacco. Thank you. So with that, thank you all very much.